Well, Jared Walsh is done for the year. The Angels are swept in Tampa. So let's talk about the Trash Pandas and the great team that they are. And let's hear you vent a little bit on voicemail. You're Locked On with Mike and John, and this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Lockdown Angels your first listen of the day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. Would you give us a rate and a review? This helps other people find the podcast, and you can do this on Apple Podcast and on Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe and click the bell to be notified every time a new episode drops. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Hey, happy Friday. We're glad you decided to join us for this edition of Lockdown Angels. You've got the Frisch Brothers here with you, a.k.a. the Super Halo Bros. My name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Well, it was a disappointing week, my brother. Uh, We got swept by the Rays in four games, and even though there were opportunities to maybe take away a win here or there, you just really can't expect much from this team these days. And I think the most disappointing part of this whole series has been the news that Jared Walsh is going to be out for the rest of the season. He's got an injury going on. And so we'll talk about that, but let's talk about this game. The angels have lost their sixth straight game. They lost it eight to three. It was an early one. And so it was nice to get that over and done with uh, earlier in the day. So you're not spending time in the evening watching, (laughs) but would you rather get your butt kicked in the afternoon or would you rather get your butt kicked (laughs) at night? I guess is really the question we're wrestling with today, right? Yeah. It was one of those games, Johnny, where we, we were kind of sort of in it. Like Sandoval pitched really well. He had six innings, five hits, just one earned, earned, earned run (laughs) and five unearned runs. They made some mistakes behind him and I'm, you know what, you've talked about his maturity and how we wanted to see him focus more and his start against Detroit. We saw some of that come out. And I have to say that I was really impressed with him today because even though they were making mistakes behind him, he hung in there mm-hmm. and to go six innings and he actually was fighting to go a little bit longer, yeah. but to go as long as he did, I think really shows his grit and determination. And it's got to be really frustrating to know, especially for the starting staff who wasn't good last year. Mm-hmm. Now they're good this year. It's got to be frustrating to know that you're pitching really well, but they're not picking you up offensively. And now they're not picking you up defensively either. Right. Yeah. And and, and I was pleased to see that he wasn't as frustrated as he can typically get because he's pretty animated and wears his emotions on his sleeve. And, and usually it is the defense costing him some runs when he's uh, right on the mound. And, and uh, so, yeah, just one unearned run for him, but six innings pitch five hits. And uh, just, uh, I mean, what, what more can you ask for out of some of these guys who are going six innings? Sandy wanted to go a seventh inning. I think Nevin was like, ah, just take a break kid. Yeah. And, uh, but to be honest, like you think about Jose Suarez and the progress he's made, the progress that Sandy and Detmers have made since last year. Honestly, Mike, like our pitching is in really good shape. I mean, honest, yeah. it, it becomes an issue of of bullpen next season, but we have lots of options. I don't expect that we'll see the ones we've been relying on, like Tuki Tucson and and uh, Jesse Chavez. I don't expect that we'll see them back next season in that capacity. Right. right. Because we have so many good arms that could be in this bullpen. So it's just funny how the script has been flipped since last year. And now the pitching's great. And the hitting is just abysmal. We do have to talk about Taylor Ward, though, getting that home run while his dad and grandparents are being interviewed or his grandma. And what I found funny was Erica Weston was talking with them. And the grandma had her camera out taking a video of Taylor's uh, at bat. And then Erica said, hey, hey, grandma. And she put the camera down. And that's when he hit the home run. (laughs) <laughs> well, at least the clip will be on TV. Uh, but yeah. I, I, it, was, it made me laugh. And then, of course, Otani had an RBI double. And we didn't have Trout in this lineup. It was a scheduled day off because these guys are playing on turf in Tampa Bay and in Toronto all week long. So they're just trying to keep these guys healthy, get them off their feet. No sense in pushing them too hard this week. We already saw Otani had that day off because of the stomach bug. And yeah. so he got his day off. Um, but the big news here. 
is Jared Walsh going on the IL for the uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Yeah. Uh, you did a little bit of research here. You got it in our notes. A disorder that occurs when blood vessels or nerves in the space between your collarbone and your first rib. I didn't even know your collarbone went down that far. Yeah. Uh, the thoracic outlet, they are compressed. And this is normally an issue. To the shoulder bone, the shoulder. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I don't remember saying thoracic bone. I don't remember um, that one either. They, probably because we were in kindergarten and we couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to yeah. Thoracic Park. Um, <laughs> but the issue here is that this is usually a, a pitcher's problem, right? Right. right. And, and so it's usually corrected with surgery. So this is going to put him out the rest of the season and maybe even influence and impact. What do we do at first base next season? We're going to have to bring somebody in. Maybe we get like a Josh Bell or a Trey Mancini while, while Walsh recovers and Honestly, I wouldn't mind that. And this is the kind of stuff that you and I talked about this season. When Rendon goes down, you should be out there signing somebody right away. Now, obviously, they're not going to do that now, given the right. season is a wash. But in the offseason, if you fully expect Jared Walsh to not be back, you can't go relying on somebody from AA or AAA just yet. You need to go out and sign somebody who's going to take his spot and take his spot in a productive way, right? Yeah, I agree. And right now they have called up Mike Ford, who is yeah. a first baseman in Salt Lake, and they DFA'd Goslin. Uh, Ford played for the Thanks Yanks. Thanks for coming, Goslin. What, right? What, yeah. What was even up with that? What was the point I, of having Goslin here? Like, I could think of somebody else that they could DFA and do no it really kidding. quickly. Like, I would rather have Goslin on the team than over Rojas because seriously, they're both they both been horrible. But Goslin at least plays a solid defensive third and he's base. Fast. But yeah. He's so he's gone and then Ford is up and Nevin knows about Ford. He actually was with the Yankees when Phil Nevin was there. Mm -hmm. And Nevin said he's very talented with the bat, very athletic, and he's going to get some chances at first base. And I wonder if this disorder, that's another strange word to describe uh, an injury, right? Because they said that about Mike Trout as well. I wonder yeah. if this has affected Walsh all season long because it has to. his numbers are terrible compared to who he was last year and the year before. And so hopefully they can get him some help. And if it's surgery, then great. Let's get him, let's get him uh, to the doctor and have him go under the knife so that he can get better because he's great defensively. He's great offensively. And perhaps that's why his throw two nights ago just missed home mm. played and cost the angels the, the, the game really. Yeah. And, and, and so it'd be great to see what Ford can do. We're at kind of in that place now where we're just kind of puzzle piecing this team together. Ryan Aguilar joined the team, but he mm -hmm. wasn't added to the roster. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with him. He's from the trash pandas. Johnny hit 280, 15 home runs, 48 RBIs in 88 games. So it I looks like, like he's got a really great bat. It'd be interesting to see what he can do. I have not heard the name Ryan Aguilar until they talked about him yesterday. And so I'm curious to see what kind of player he really is. And we're kind of in that, it feels like spring training, but in August, right? Where mm -hmm. we have all of these guys that wouldn't necessarily be starting for us because everybody is hurt. But I think it's a good move to have Walsh go on the IL and figure that out because why Why continue to play? Uh, I read that Frostad, the uh, the manager when it comes to like injuries and athletic trainer, out things, yeah, yeah, athletic yeah. trainer. Thank you. Um, he he said that uh, Walsh had said something to him a couple weeks ago, like, "Hey, this doesn't feel right. Something's mm. not good there." And so I wonder how long it hasn't been feeling right. And then he finally said something because you know these guys are probably gonna tough it out because they've yeah. got a guy like Shohei Otani who can foul something off his leg and then hit a triple and be fine. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I just have to say that when it comes to Jared Walsh and in the past, David Fletcher, Anthony Rendon, and even Mike Trout this season, we have to really, as fans, we need to slow our roll when it comes to criticizing players on the field, because obviously Walsh was trying to play through this. Obviously he's been struggling the last month and a half. And when his numbers started to dip and this yeah. injury must be affecting all the parts of his game. I mean, still, he was great defensively while he was slumping, but to power through this is really something. And the same can be said for Fletcher. Everybody was giving him grief for not being good at the end of last season, the beginning of this season. It's like, well, the guy's hurt. And yep. they finally come out with the, the news that Jared Walsh is hurt. And that was the same thing with Rendon and the same thing with Trout and the same thing with <laughs> Fletcher. So we really just need to be patient and understand that these guys are great athletes and they try to tough it out and play through the pain. And I think that we owe them some patience as fans.
Well, coming up on Locked On Angels, we talked about how tough it is to be an Angel fan and root for the Angels. So let's talk about the best team in the Angels organization, the Trash Pandas. But first, Locked On Angels is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. You can find your favorite sports and events at the number one source for all odds, lines, and games. There's reviews and league news of every league like baseball, football, basketball, hockey, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They've got you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. Mike, the best team in the Angels organization is their double A affiliate, the Rocket City Trash Pandas out of Alabama. Uh, they have a ridiculous name and they have ridiculously good players. <laughs> yes, I they do. I love their logo. I love their name. And their Twitter handle says, yes, that's actually our name. And I think that's going to that. be my next hat here. I, I got this one this week. And so my next hat is going to have to be a trash panda. That's hat a good because... hat there, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so th- what's interesting about the trash panda is, is that the angels system has kind of hoarded all of their best players in double yeah. a yeah. and are the best pitching is there. The best hitting is there. If you watch highlights of the trash pandas, they're a lot of fun. Zach Neto, who just got drafted earlier this month is now in, in the, uh, trash Panda's organization and he's killing it and so i think they are just building a winning culture and perry minasian has spoke to that in the past that it's great to have all these guys in the same uh, uh, affiliate and team and have and watching them win so let's talk about some of the key players that we have here you got it let's talk about logan ohapi because he's the guy that we traded for we traded brandon marsh for and a lot of people were really frustrated with that trade but i think Still convinced that that's the best trade the Angels made mm-hmm. at the trade deadline because Ohapi seems to be a really great catcher and suddenly became our number one guy when we got him. And so he played 75 games with the Phillies A team, put up some great numbers, uh, 392, 469, 889. Those are some mm-hmm. strong offensive numbers. He's only played 12 games with the Trash Pandas, but Johnny, 429, 711, and 1140 is his stats. And he's got six home runs in 45 at bats wow. in double a. And so, so his, 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 his on base plus slugging is 1140. Yes. Yeah. Good grief, man. In He's just 12 games, it. he has come and has turned it on. And so yeah. that's that's awesome. And he's really hit a lot of bombs too, which is great. And then defensively, I thought this was an interesting stat and a key stat because we've seen Max Stassi really struggle throwing runners out. And we've yeah. also seen Kurt Suzuki do the same thing. Uh, Ohapi has a 21% caught stealing rate, which is high, which is good. And I think that that's only going to get better as he grows defensively. And boy, do we need that because it seems like Stassi's throws are always a second to a second and a half late Mm -hmm, when they're mm -hmm. thrown down. And then, you know, Suzuki, we know he's older, so his arm isn't as strong as it was. But we just really haven't been able to defend the run. And then when Syndergaard was there, it was really hard because Syndergaard's, Syndergaard's like load, it takes a while. And so they have a lot of issues there you mentioned zach netto why don't you run through his numbers well real quick uh ohapi's pop time the the time it takes for him to jump up and make the throw to second have you seen clips of him throwing guys out because yes. before the before the camera can even cut to second base the ball is already halfway there which tells me how fast his pop time is and i think that's part of what is the problem with Stassi and especially Suzuki. It's getting out of the crowd's position and getting to your body to a place where you can throw the ball hard. And Ohapi, man, he is incredible at that. He's got some and hops. <laughs> he's got some hop. There you go. Uh, yeah, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about Zach Neto. 19 games. He's hitting 311, 402, 47, and a combined on base plus slugging 889. Two wow. home runs and 17 RBIs. Man, he just just imagine you got drafted. And you're already on a double A team and you're crushing it and you're having a great go with the Rocket City Trash Pandas. And we have really needed somebody to be the shortstop of the future. And it looks like that could be his role, especially given this year where we just had a a black hole of shortstops rotating in and out. I know Fletcher's been there, but to be honest, I mean, that wasn't really the plan at the beginning of the season. It was like, maybe we'll have Fletcher there. Maybe he'll play second base. That just was not a clear path at that point yeah and, and how about kai when, bush kai bush has really actually turned it on this year six and yeah. two three one eight era 82 innings pitched, 81 k's 
And I think that he could be somebody that we could see sooner rather than later. I mean, mm-hmm. if Seth is coming up, I think Kai Bush is somebody that could get called up soon as well. And so I, I'd love to see him up there. And then Sam Bachman, we've mm-hmm. talked a lot about Sam Bachman being maybe a reliever, but they've had him start in double a and he yeah. has nine starts, a, a three, four, eight ERA doesn't have a record yet. 31 innings, 21 K's, but the, the big name, Johnny is Ben Joyce. Yes. And big Joyce name, big arm. Drafted. Yeah. He, he really throws some heat. So his numbers aren't impressive because he's only pitched really in just five games, uh, mm-hmm. a 360 ERA, five innings pitch, six K's. But here's, here's a stat that I thought was interesting from August 20th last mm-hmm. week. He threw his fastest pro pitches. He faced four batters, Dang. batter number one. He threw a hundred miles an hour four times, John. Wow. And then look at the, look at the difference between his fastball and his off speed. He threw two pitches at 84 and 82 miles an hour. I mean, wow. that's a, that's a huge gap. Now he walked that batter batter. Number two, again, four pitches over a hundred miles an hour with an 89 mile an hour pitch in there. He struck that batter out. And then he threw three pitches to batter number three, 85, 85, and 100. And then batter number four, that batter flew out. And then batter number four, 85, 101, 101. Dang. And he struck him out. Look at the difference between his fastball and his off speed. That is going right. to be killer when we get to see that Absolutely. in the Halos bullpen. That feels like K Rod, right? That feels like Troy Percival. And when we talk about these players, I think there's a couple of things that kind of bubble to the surface as we talk about these guys, Johnny. One, right. I think that we need them to continue to develop and they need some time to cook. So I don't Let think that we should expect them, <laughs> right? We don't need we don't we shouldn't expect them to show up at the start of next season. And right. maybe for some of these guys we may not see them next year. Maybe for like would you say like Kai Bush, maybe we see him in June or maybe even a Sam Bachman? Where do you think those two guys land next season in 2023? Well, Sam's been hurt, so I think that he needs some more time in the minors to just get right get right because he hasn't been throwing as hard as he did previously to the injury. I could see Kai Bush possibly even in the rotation next season. Mm. Uh, I know that we don't want to rush anything, but like yeah. I could see him maybe not even at the beginning of the season, maybe a little bit later. And then I think when Lindsey Crosby was on, he was on the show and he actually talked about Kai Bush. And they said that, that really what's slowing him down was being consistent in how he's throwing the ball, like having Mm. the same spot where he's Mm -hmm. releasing the ball because he was releasing a fastball a little higher and he was releasing a curveball a little lower. And Kai Bush is tall, right? Like he's, he's six foot, he's six foot something. And, and so he's got that intimidating presence. And so he just needs to get his mechanics down and get them consistent. And then we'll probably see him a lot sooner rather than later. And there's no reason to rush him up because the, the rotation is so strong and I know that they'll need one or two other starters next season. But I do have to say that if they want to bring him up, I I could see that happening. I also say they got to have a I think up with this team next season. Yeah, why not? I think that, that that's a shoe in for me. So yeah. Uh, Does he start but, for your team next year or do you still have Max Stassi start? I'd have both of them start. I mean, uh, okay. w- you know, I think Max might be the backup. I think I'd rather see Ohapi out there more often, but I think one thing we can't forget is that how much Max factors into how well he coaches and manages and catches the starting rotation, even though he's been, uh, you know, butts at the plate, <laughs> the official term. <laughs> I think that he still is important to how he catches these starters. And I think he has a lot to do with that and how he calls a game and manages a game and everything. Well, we uh, really appreciate you making Lockdown Angels your first listen of the day. And last Friday, we started a new tradition on Lockdown Angels. Yes. And we call it venting voicemails and it's exactly (laughs) what it sounds like it's an opportunity for you to share some of your thoughts about some of the issues with the angels and we have the privilege of having microphones for 30 minutes for five (laughs) days a week and so we get to vent but we wanted to give you some time and some space to be able to do the same thing so johnny let's play that first voicemail here we go hey guys manny here from whittier Hopefully, just hopefully, we get an owner who is willing to go over the luxury tax. You know, we know Artie Moreno would never do that. So hopefully, this is the 
time that we finally get someone who's willing to go over and willing to put a winning team on the field. Um, and what do you guys think of possibly the Clippers owner? What do you think of him possibly being a candidate for uh, to buy the team? Uh, let me know what you guys think. Uh, thank you. Bye. Manny from Whittier, thanks for giving us a call, man. We always It's always great hearing from you. Mike, two things. Uh, is this new owner going to go over the luxury tax? Well, in my opinion, if you're going to spend 2.2 to almost $3 billion on this team, then you're going to have the money to do so, and you're going to yeah. have all the incentive to do so because yeah. you're not going to buy this team and then not go for it with going over the luxury tax. And you and I did the research, and we had our friend uh, do the research as well, and, and that Twitter account that talked about how much money Artie has wasted on not going over the luxury tax and paying yeah. players to sit on the bench. What do you think about the Steve Ballmer aspect of that? You know, Steve Ballmer hasn't really expressed interest in owning a baseball team or even owning the Angels, but I think that actually is an intriguing owner. When he I bought like the Clippers, they were really scuffling, man. They He bought them in 2014. Before 2014, they had three seasons where they had a winning percentage under 400. They mm. were 390, 354. They had a 232 and a 280 season. Since Balmer has purchased the Clippers, they have not dropped under 500 mm. since. Like they have played at mm. least 500 basketball moving forward. I, I don't think that Balmer is going to be the guy, but I do think that whoever we get, I think it would be wise of them to spend some money. And remember, remember, Already when he purchased this team, he became the official owner in 2003. And then in 2004, who did he go and get? He right. went and got Vlad that, Guerrero, right? Yeah. He allowed the team to do that. Then they got Tory Hunter. I think that the new ownership just needs wise people to actually be in the positions to make those decisions. Because mm -hmm. once we hit 2010 and moving forward, some of the people, GMs specifically, that were in place were not making really solid decisions. Tony no. Regans made some really difficult, I think, bonehead decisions in some of yeah. the trades when he traded away Mike Napoli and got Vernon Wells. And it was just it was just a mess. And we were yeah. like, why are you doing that? And then Napoli just plagued us for the rest of his career. Right. And I think that we need a Bill Stoneman like figure. Bill Stoneman, remember, was still in charge when Artie Moreno bought the team. And mm -hmm. so we need a good GM. I think Perry is that guy. We should let Perry do what Perry does and yeah. let him work out what he needs to work out. Great leaders allow leaders to do what they're good at. And so new ownership, we know you're listening and we need you to do what is right by the angel fans and what is right by those who are employed by the angels. Let's get it done and let's figure this out. Absolutely. And then I have to say, I I want somebody with a Balmer, Steve Balmer energy because yes. he came in and really wanted to help the Clippers win. The other thing I like that he's doing is he, he was trying to get them to have their own uh, arena, their own yep. stadium in Inglewood yep. so that they're not in the shadow of the Lakers. I think that that's also really important. So yeah, I, I think somebody with a bomber energy, even though he might not be the one to purchase them, would be really great. Let's go to another one. This one made me laugh. Okay. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. The day is here. Christmas in August. Artie is selling the team. Thank goodness. couple thoughts. One, who do we want to be an owner? Do we want a Steve Cohen type? Do we want a Derek Jeter type? Maybe even Derek Jeter himself to get back involved in ownership? Or do we want somebody that's local here that understands or the Orange County and the Angel brand and what they mean to this place. And lastly, is a name change in the works. Wouldn't it be great if we returned to the name California Angels? Look forward to listening to you guys. That one made me laugh. Christmas in August, Mike. Dashing <laughs> through the snow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Selling I, the team. I, I love that. Um, I, I, I think a couple thoughts. First, I would want somebody with a lot of money. They're going to have to have a lot of money, right? Right. Um, it might be that an ownership group would be wise. I mm -hmm. think it would be a wise decision. Remember, Derek Jeter is not with the Marlins anymore because right. when he was going to be a part of that ownership group, there were promises made that they were going to contend. And when they didn't contend, he backed out. So yeah. maybe Derek Jeter can actually be a part of the ownership group in Anaheim. And I think that yeah. actually would be beneficial because he's a player. He gets it. I think that's one of the reasons why the Dodgers are so good because Magic Johnson is a player, not 
baseball, but basketball, but he's right. a player and he gets what teams need to be successful. And so I would love to have a Jeter esque type of figure, especially as a figurehead who will get in front of a camera and can handle himself because he, he crushed it in New York. And so I would love that. I would love somebody that can spend some money. And I like the point about, are they aware of the area? I think you got to mm-hmm. know the area and you got to have sort of a love for this area instead of just kind of coming in and saying, here's what we're going to do. I think we need somebody that is going to be aware of the history of the halos, the history of the players and somebody who's going to be aware of that history of the area and be honor honorable to that area yeah. and then help the team to move forward. When, when I went to the all-star game at Dodger stadium, I was really impressed with how they celebrate the Latin culture and the Latino culture here in Los Angeles. And, and I think that somebody really needs to understand, you know, who's in Anaheim, the the population, the culture, what they celebrate and, and connect that to the halos. And I think that they used to do a good job of that. I think that a lot of that's kind of fallen off in the last decade or so. But the other thing is, is that the ownership group of the Dodgers came in and understood that and they made, yep. you know, Latin oh, heritage sure. night a weekly thing. And They're brilliant. I also think that with, with Derek Jeter too, um, I, I would like to see him be part of an ownership group because like you said, he's a great figurehead. And also when, when the Marlins decided they weren't going to contend and spend money, he was like, well, then that's not the plan. The plan was yeah. to come here and spend money and make this team good. I also like, I would, I want a Steve Cohen type. I like that Steve Cohen with the Mets is on Twitter and he interacts with the fans and he uh, is willing to spend money and, and make the team good. That's what we need. I mean, you look at the Mets, we always call them the East coast angels and we're the West coast Mets because they've been on similar trajectories the last 10 years and just takes one person to come in and spend some money and get the right pieces in place and, and put a winning team on the field as we see with the Mets right now. Let's go to our last one right here, Mike. Hey guys, it's Steve from Kansas again. You talked on the pod earlier this morning about uh, how Pujols' last five or six games is just on fire, and I I think I speak for all Halo fans everywhere when I say I don't want to hear it. But anyway, that's not why I'm calling. Calling about the whole Artie Moreno thing. I know that Artie Moreno wasn't making the best choices, but I, I can't imagine we get a brand new like the perfect owner comes in, buys the team right away makes all the right moves. I want to know if your thoughts if, if you think uh, Artie leaving would um, actually be bad for our chances of re-signing Sho- Shohei and also for getting Trout to the World Series just because of the instability. All right. You guys do a great job. Bye. Steve from Kansas, thank you for your voicemail. My friend, you're venting a voicemail. Doesn't want to hear about Pujols being successful, Mike. How do you feel about that? <laughs> What if Albert's a part of the new ownership group? Would that be a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I want the guy to get to 700. I think I want him to see, uh, I want him to break a record because he got most of those home runs with us. He got at yeah. least, you know, 250 of them with us. So right. uh, I would like to see that happen just because it's historic and you want to be around for history like that. Um, yeah. but when it comes to an ownership group, look, there's going to be or, uh, next ownership coming in. There's going to be some turmoil. There's going to be some uncertainty out there. And when I think about how the ownership group went with the Dodgers, they went from Frank McCourt stealing and siphoning off money and running this thing into the ground. And then his wife bankrupting the team to the magic Johnson owned group. I mean, they immediately had success. I know 2013 right. started out a little bit rough and they were able to turn it around. But it's just, I honestly, I look at how we were at the beginning of the season when we had a full and healthy staff and I understand the infrastructure needs to get better, but somebody can come in here, make one or two or three great moves and fix this team. And I also understand that we're worried about the window in which, you know, there's a year left of Shohei. Can this deal get done fast enough to where a new owner would want to keep Shohei around or perhaps already re-signs Shohei and extends him to keep him around? I, I, as much as I want to see Shohei stay on this team and I know that he's a, a winner and he helps us win and I want to see him stay with the angels. I, I think that if there things are a little tumultuous over the next year and we don't get him, it's not the end of the world because whoever comes in as an owner can sign will can and will sign players, a good arm, a good bat, like we have in Shohei. So I understand that it would suck to lose him. But the reason why we're so scared of losing Otani is because we're not confident in Artie Marino ever going and getting a player on his caliber. Not that there is anybody on his caliber, but what I'm saying is the next ownership 
should go out and get somebody to, who can hit like Shohei, who can pitch like Shohei, and spend money on a player like Shohei if it's not Shohei himself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And I think that what Angel fans are going to find is they will be pleasantly surprised with what happens over the course of the next six months to a year. Mm -hmm. I have found in watching sports my entire life that there have only been moments where you're kind of like, what? I can't believe that happened or that he signed there or re-signed. I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised with what happens with the Angels with what happens specifically with Shohei. And when I say pleasantly surprised, I think we'll be pleasantly surprised to see that when he signs, we'll go, oh, wow. Or if we end up trading him, I think that we'll be pleasantly surprised with the players that we get back. And with a new ownership group, I think that we're going to have somebody, I would hope that we would have somebody that communicates well with the fans. And if they communicate well with the fans, which I think is their number one priority, then the fans are going to give them some grace just like we've given Jared Walsh some grace. We like him. He hustles, mm -hmm. even though he's been struggling. Now he's hurt and kind of makes sense. That's the same thing that an owner can do. Get in front of a microphone, tell the people what's happening, communicate well, don't give me plaid answers, give me real honest answers so that I know what's happening. And I think that you're going to see that and we're going to be pleasantly surprised over the next six to, to 12 months. Agreed. Yeah. Well, thanks for sending in your venting voicemails. We're always open to take more of those and play those on Friday before we hit the weekend. So thank you to everybody who sent those in. And thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. Now make your second listen, the Locked On MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings his humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and shares some of the biggest stories from around the league. You can follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB, on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, give us a follow on Twitter, at Locked On Angels, and connect with Mike and I on Twitter and Instagram, at Super Halo Bros. You're going to want to do so because... On Monday, Michael, what do we have? Mailbag Monday. So send us your questions, send us your thoughts, and send us your voicemails. We would love to hear from you. You can call us 714-409-6396. Of course, send us a direct message or comment below on YouTube or on our Twitter page. We would love to hear from you. One of our favorite episodes, one of our favorite days. Mailbag Monday coming up on Monday on Locked on Angels. Looking forward to that. We hope you guys have a great weekend. And until then, my name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. And we'll see you right back here on Monday for more Locked On Angels.